This book is dedicated to anyone who has ever fallen in love with a culture that was devouring their own. Dialect is a role-playing game written by Katherine Himes and Hakan Sayalioglu, and published in 2018. The premise is this. You are members of an isolation, a group of people who have, by physical distance, professional necessity, or political exclusion, become separate from the culture of the majority of your world. Inside your little enclave, you will develop your own language, and throughout the course of play, watch as it evolves with your community's circumstances. Players draw from a deck of prompt cards, compare their prompts to certain aspects of their setting, design a new word that fits the intersection of the prompt and aspect, and then roleplay a scene in which the new word is used. Players will each take a turn following the sequence of rules, and once they're all finished, the setting will experience a shift known as an age, during which the community will undergo some sort of change. This set of rules alone makes Dialect one of the most fascinating games on the market, but what's especially profound is how these ages end. From the very beginning of the game, players are told that once they complete their third age, their isolation is over. Their little community is reabsorbed by that exterior culture, and their nascent language ceases to exist, except in the memories of its speakers. The text encourages players to cheer for their characters in spite of the certain demise, to love their language as if there is some way to preserve it forever, even when it can't be saved. That Doomsday Countdown is an especially powerful mechanical tool. When you know that one day, you will be taken back into the world, you have to cherish everything unique and original before it's too late. Arkady Martin published her Hugo-winning space opera A Memory Called Empire in 2019. In this novel, Ambassador Mahit Dismar is sent from her home station of La Salle to negotiate with the Aztec and Byzantine-inspired empire of Texcalan. Her primary goal is one of preservation. Texcalan is enormous and hungry, controlling a quarter of the galaxy, and Mahit needs to protect her home from becoming the empire's next meal. I won't go through the whole plot, you should pick up the book yourself if you've got a chance. But I bring it up in comparison with dialect because of the way the novel uses language as a tool of both world building and plot. Because LaSalle is essentially an independent nation, it has a unique culture and language separate from that of the Empire, an isolation, to use dialect's terminology. However, Mahit has spent her entire adult life preparing to live among the people of Texcalan, studying not just their language, but their poetry their movies, their music. When she was a little girl, she used to imagine herself as a citizen of Texcalan, moving in their circles and living as one of them. But as Mahit got older, she understood this was not possible. The thing about Texcalan, the thing about many empires, is that they believe themselves to be the mold, the archetype, the blazing sun at the center of the galaxy around which all other planets spin. Mahit loves Texcalan, but the Empire would only view this as natural. The word for the capital of Texcalan, translated into English, is simply the city. But that word also translates into the world, and furthermore, the Empire. The Texcalanli language cannot conceive of a world without Empire. It's not grammatically possible. This linguistic imperial mandate is further demonstrated when considering their conquest of additional nations. When Texcalan annex as a nation, they describe it as bringing new territories into the empire. But Mahit catches the double meaning of this phrase, that, if interpreted uncharitably, it could mean, make new territories real. There is an inherent superiority in the way Texcalan describes everything outside of itself. And this syntactic snobbery trickles down into everything the people of the empire believe as well. There's only one word used for people who are not citizens of Texcalan, barbarian. And even Mahit's guide and friend, Three Seagrass, does not refrain from using the term. By contrast, there is not a way to describe anything Texcalanly as barbaric, not even their ancient practice of human sacrifice. Imperial language has a cultural bias, and it warps the world around it, until those on the periphery have to either succumb to its gravity or forcibly break away from its pool. That strength of culture, to devour even more completely than a conquering army, 
is one of the primary themes of a memory called Empire, one which ties directly into the themes of dialect. You can't shoot a language, but it can die all the same. Maybe the citizens of LaSalle Station live in physical isolation, but they cannot escape the influence of Takes Kalan. They rely on the Empire as an important trading partner, and with every shipment of Takes Kalanli goods, they also receive its culture, poetry, plays, books. And it's these cultural artifacts which are slowly consuming the station, colonizing the imaginations and ambitions of its young people. They don't need to send armies to LaSalle, they just have to make the stationers wish they were already annexed, already made real by the civilizing rays of the sun. The ever-encroaching presence of Takes Kalan mirrors the ways in which dialect signals to its players that their little community is unable to remain intact forever. In the scenarios provided by the text, there are themes which come up repeatedly when looking at the age transitions, constant reminders of the tightening noose. New arrivals, sudden disasters that force the isolation to ask for outside help, new buildings and products that lure members away from their community in search of a better life. In every scenario, the influence of the outside world is unavoidable. You cannot keep yourself entirely separate from others, for good or ill. You will always be affected by things outside yourself. The struggle, both for the players of dialect and for Mahit Desmar, is to remain independent even while those external forces threaten to assimilate them entirely, annihilating unique languages, cultures, and ways of viewing the world in the process. There's a quote that I've often seen online that goes, you speak English because it's the only language you know, I speak English because it's the only language you know. And I think that sentiment is only going to become more common as English-speaking nations continue to influence global politics, trade, and culture. In 2023, Statista estimated 1.4 billion people worldwide spoke English, but Wikipedia estimates that over a billion of those English speakers learned it as their second language. That is an astonishing mismatch, and it speaks to the strength of imperial powers to warp the world around them, to use their own power to assimilate those nations outside the core. Martine is especially aware of the outsized influence of English on the rest of the world. In an interview with NPR, she likens Takes Kalan's cultural domination to American imperialism, citing Hollywood movies and McDonald's as inescapable touchstones. Quote, my development of the civilized versus barbarian concept that Takes Kalan is based on is from Rome and Byzantium. It is also the experience of many, many people right now, who either choose or are forced into assimilation into a larger, more dominant, and oppressive culture, and how that assimilation is never total, always conditional, never complete." End quote. When access to some of the wealthiest corporations, the highest quality goods, and the most popular cultural artifacts are locked behind a particular language barrier, people are willing to undertake the monstrous task of learning that language in order to reap the benefits of access. But to quote Martine again, nothing touched by empire stays clean. In dialect, your isolation will inevitably collapse. Your commune will fall, outsiders will arrive, and sooner rather than later, you will be brought back into the world. The language you built will fall away, living only in your memory. And that would be a pretty bleak ending, one that, I feel, reflects the reality of how most languages die. Culture is a thing that absolutely can be consumed and annihilated by forces larger than itself. But dialect allows for a moment of preservation, a last glance back, a chance for players to ask, what does it mean to keep a culture alive? At the very end of play, each player draws a legacy card, and answers a prompt about what remains once the isolation has collapsed. These prompts are unique in that, unlike most of the collaborative nature of dialect, they are not conversations, they are straightforward descriptions. These prompts vary in tone. A grave misunderstanding, the shame that comes with loss, out of the ash, a seedling sprouts. They also do not necessarily need to be descriptions of an event immediately following the end of the isolation, they can jump around in time. Maybe it's a moment at the very start of the isolation, or maybe it's a scene decades in the future. But these last descriptions are the legacy of your language, a snapshot of the way your tiny culture ought to be remembered. 
I think this epilogue at the end of Dialect matters because it's not just a capstone, it's a eulogy. The rules text ends with the sentence, You are the sole speakers of your dialect now. And I think that statement is both condolence and warning. If, as Arkady Martin says, nothing touched by Empire stays clean, players of dialect must understand that assimilation comes for us all, that no matter how hard we struggle, we do not live in a world where we can remain untainted. And even so, I think Himes and Salioglu are begging us to try anyway, to keep the memory of our cultures alive, no matter how we are seduced by Empire, no matter how all-encompassing hegemony might seem. We must keep some portion of ourselves alive, not give ourselves fully to the world, even if it's only in the way we remember the past, even if it's only a hope for the future. It's the only way we can remain real. Thank you to everybody for watching. I really appreciate anyone who takes the time to see what I'm saying about tabletop games. Uh, if you want to help me keep the channel going, you can send me a tip at my Ko-Fi in the video description. My background picture is Liquified Image by Adrian on Unsplash, and my profile picture is by Eater Outsider on Tumblr. If you want to find more of my work, I'm at AAVoy on Blue Sky, Monster Factory fanfic on Tumblr, but my main site is aavoid.com, where I also talk about games and writing. I do a podcast that's Mortified the Friendship Quest, uh, where me and my friend Layla do critical media analysis. Uh, we just finished talking about Shrek the Musical, um, so if you want to see uh, what several months of analyzing the Shrek franchise does to your brain, um, check that one out. It's uh, It'll be interesting. Uh, thanks again, as always, for watching. Uh, until my next video, see y'all.